Welcome. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here today at our webinar on the prerequisites um, apologies, um, on the prerequisites for the role of the transmission system operator in gas in India, learning from a global perspective. I am Manali Sia Hasra, regional energy manager and clean energy specialist at USAID India. Today's webinar has been organized by US Asia Gas Partnership or AGP in short an initiative launched by USAID in 2019. AGP is a public-private partnership between government and industry representatives to optimize the development of secure, reliable, and economic sources of natural gas across the Indo-Pacific. The partnership is designed to both highlight technical topics for regulators, utilities, and policymakers across the region and to foster business development and networking. For today's webinar, AGP is collaborating with USAID South Asia Regional Energy Hub, or SARE, a co coordination and communication platform to support USAID's energy program in South Asia and ICF consulting. The government of India has a goal to increase the share of natural gas in the country's energy basket to 15% by 2030. Currently, this share stands at around 6%. It is expected that the sector will require an investment of more than $50 billion in natural gas infrastructure to meet this goal. Creation of demand, supply infrastructure, and a vibrant competitive market are essential to ensure that the delivery of the commodity is accessible and affordable. On the demand side, India has successfully completed the 10th round of the city gas distribution or CGD bidding. This network will cover 402 districts and approximately 70% of India population. The CGD network will help capture latent demand from the residential, transport, and commercial and industrial sector. The 11th round of the bidding is also under preparation to bring in additional 100 districts under CGD. However, natural gas cannot be available to all unless the sector and the infrastructure is accessible to all. Therefore, on the supply side, easy and transparent access to the gas pipeline is essential to enable greater competition and bring multiple sellers, traders, and marketers into the game. India has already witnessed the benefits of having power system operator in the form of Posico, independent of the infrastructure owner that is power grid. It has enabled open access of power lines to thousands of buyers and sellers and helped achieved market transaction to the tune of 10% of total electricity sales at a attractive prices. With the creation of an independent transmission system operator for gas, there would be separation between content, which is gas, and carriage, which is infrastructure. This will enable the natural gas industry a similar market transformation and move towards an open natural gas market. With the announcement of an appointment of the independent gas TSO in India, the finance minister has set a very positive tone towards enabling reforms and a transparent allocation of open access capacities in the natural gas pipeline. Today's webinar is very timely. The experts will discuss different models for adoption of TSO in India. The challenges and required regulation needed for implementation of these models will be examined. Our presenters will also highlight some of the key market issues prerequisites and learning from other countries for a successful implementation of TSO in India. In closing, I'd like to thank our Chief Guest, Sri Tarun Kapoor, Secretary MOPNG, who will be joining us later today. I would also like to thank all the speakers for carving out time to share the unique perspectives with us today. We greatly appreciate your time and commitment. I would also like to thank the organizing team from USCA or United States Energy Association, ICF and SARE for the efforts to organized today's session. Next, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Sheila Hollis, Interim Executive Director, U.S. Energy Association to provide her introductory remarks. Over to you, Sheila. Thank you so much, Manali. It's a real honor to be here and to join you this morning. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with the United States Energy Association, we're a nonprofit, non-lobbying institution uh, about a century old. Uh, we really have two pillars in our mission. Uh, they are of equal importance. Uh, we first convene, educate, and serve as a resource for the American energy industry. And second, we work with USAID, the Department of Energy, and the U.S. Department of State with the goal to better the lives of people throughout the world by working with them to provide affordable, clean, and reliable energy access. 
USEA is one of uh, two implementing partners for the United States Agency for International Development in the US-Asia Gas Partnership Program, otherwise known as AGP. AGP is funded through the EUPP, that is the Energy Utility Partnership Program, a cooperative initiative between the United States Energy Association and USAID under the Bureau for Development, De De Democracy and Innovation. EUPP works under the Bureau for Development uh, of, De of Democracy and Innovation. And we work around the world to promote energy security, cleaner energy access and capacity building to improve operations and increase energy access. By bringing countries together and encouraging knowledge, knowledge sharing of global best practices, EUPP provides emerging markets with access to US public and private, private sector uh, players uh, with expertise and technical assistance. This transfer of information to our country partners with, has a goal to improve management efficiency, achieve economic uh, benefits, increase revenue collection, Private, privatize utility functions, enhance employee productivity, and operate within a safe regulatory environment. These partnership activities are conducted through executive exchanges, training sessions, technical assistance, using energy industry uh, experts from the energy uh, industry, in-country workshops, and conferences. Obviously, we've been challenged, as has everyone else, because of the uh, worldwide pandemic situation. As Manali mentioned, AGP fosters collaboration between the public and private sectors in South and Southeast Asia and in the United States. USEA is a key player in the formation of these relationships, utilizing the expertise and experience of our members, uh, including today's presenters and organizers from ICF. Since COVID began a year ago uh, through AGP, USEA has reached out to stakeholders in their homes through, through a series of live uh, and recorded webinars lead featuring US and international gas sector experts. <clears throat> to date, we have conducted eight webinars and we've drawn a total of uh, nearly, uh, of more than actually than 3,500 participants worldwide. This is just part of USEA's remote assistance capacity building efforts during these tough times. We are covering a wide spectrum of topics from advanced technologies to market development to climate mitigation uh, strategies in the energy sector. And we encourage you, please do check out our website, that's usea.org and social media for more information. Uh, most of the, almost all of the work that we do, you can find on the USEA website and uh, watch it at your leisure. Uh, you can sign up also to receive information for all uh, future events as well. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention the wonderful um, uh, news that we will be joined today uh, by <coughs> Sri Tarun Kapoor, uh, who will join us as a Secretary of Petroleum and Natural Gas, and that is a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, piece of news for us today. We would like you all to be uh, aware of our thanks to you, uh, and we are so delighted to be with you today. And we look forward to seeing you virtually in upcoming USEA hosted Asia Gas Partnership webinars. Now I would like to pass the stage over to our ICF partners in this webinar, uh, wonderful partners. And I welcome Mr. Ankit Gupta, Managing Consultant of Oil and Gas for ICF India. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you Ankit, thank you so much. Thank you, Sheila. So uh, I'll just put up my screen for a presentation. Okay, uh, I hope my screen is visible and uh, I would like to welcome everyone to the webinar on role of transmission system operator in gas in India. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm Ankit Gupta, Managing Consultant, Oil and Gas at ICF. And I'll be taking you through this short presentation to set the context of, uh, of the webinar today. First, uh, uh, to introduce, ICF is a global consulting services company with uh, over 7,000 full-time employees. We have 70 plus offices worldwide with close to 1.5 billion as US dollar as revenue. We have a net zero status since 2006 and have completed 50 years of operation globally in 2019 and have completed 15 years of operation in India. 
Today, we do have an excellent participation and uh, officials from more than 38 countries have registered uh, for this specific webinar. Therefore, before moving to the core topic, I would like to share a brief overview about the Indian natural gas sector. Indian gas sector has a vision uh, to uh, make India a gas-based economy with an ambitious target of uh, natural gas to have 15% gas share in the primary energy market by 2030. We have uh, 400 plus districts being authorized to, to enable access of natural gas and it is covering close to 70% of the population and close to 53% of Indian geography. And it is seen as one of the major sectors which has the highest potential to grow as a sector in India. The share of CGD in natural gas consumption has grown from 9% to close to 19% in last eight years among the other sectors which consumes natural gas. We have also Indian gas exchange uh, as well as gas exchange regulations, which were finalized last year. It, will, it is a platform to enable uh, transparent market price discovery of natural gas in India. We also have a recent development on, on the unified tariff regulations, which were notified uh, to simplify the existing pipeline tariff system in India with an objective to limit the cascading effect of tariffs reaching to the end consumer. We also see that uh, by bringing the unified tariff, it will also enable ease of gas trading via exchange. Moving next uh, uh, to, and to achieve a target of natural gas share to reach 15% in the primary energy mix, there is a need to have a well laid gas pipeline network to enable access of natural gas to end consumers. And if we look at the pipeline infrastructure, we know that the, uh, that the total length of authorized natural gas pipeline is close to 32,500 32, kilometers, of which close to 17,000 kilometers is operational, while other 15,000 odd kilometers is under construction. Gale have the highest share in terms of pipeline length, followed by GSPL and BIL. As per regulations in India, 25% of the total pipeline capacity is earmarked as a common carrier capacity. We understand that India is looking to have an independent operator who is expected to manage the open access capacity. Under the current scenario, entities and customers who want to book capacity uh, on a common carrier, they must apply to the specific pipeline entities. And some of these entities have developed a portal through which such capacities can be booked. The customer needs to provide details like capacity requirement, plant location in the portal, which is analyzed by the pipeline entities to initiate booking of such capacity. However, under the proposed scenario, it is expected that creation of a system operator, which mostly could be an independent entity, will manage this common carrier capacity of the entire gas pipeline system in India. With this provision, it is an expected that the end consumer may not have to go through specific pipeline entity for capacity booking, but probably can go on a single portal to book such capacities. And this provision is being developed to enable more transparency in the system and avoid any possible discriminatory practice uh, if such exists in this specific sector. So let us look at the model elsewhere to understand the options which are available. And here I will briefly touch upon the different TSO models which uh, primarily got originated in EU and different member states follow different uh, models over there. The first model is full ownership unbundling where the transmission system is completely separated from the parent who look after the supply and marketing function. Such ownership unbundled entity owns and operate the network. And it is very similar to uh, the UK model where the NGT is completely ownership unbundled from the marketing as well as uh, uh, supply uh, arm of the company. The, the second model is of the independent system operator. Under this model, the pipeline ownership is legally unbundled from the parent company. However, the transmission assets are owned. And so basically the transmission assets are owned by a subsidiary of the supply company, which is in a way a legal and un functional unbundling. In addition, a new ownership unbundled entity or a separate entity is created whose task is to operate the pipeline system. And, but does not own any specific pipeline assets. So if we look at this, uh, uh, at this specific uh, chart, we have this transmission system operator, which is an independent uh, uh, body from the uh, 
parent company and the transmission system owner is the one who is actually owning the asset whereas this independent entity typically operates the assets the third model is independent transmission operator which is also termed as ito model under this model each function of the company is legally unbundled with certain strict unbundling requirements to avoid any kind of discriminatory practice the transmission system is both owned and operated by an affiliate of the supply company and since the model works on a typical legally unbundled structure the responsibility of the regulator to check compliance uh, is increased considerably wherever the member states have adopted such kind of a model so today in the discussions ahead we will try to understand from different speakers uh, to give more clarity on which could be the best suited model for india and possibly what are the directions in which india is thinking about to adopt any specific model so what are the discussions ahead in this webinar first we will listen from an international perspective about the transmission system operators how they were developed in the respective country a keynote address by shri tarun kapoor on rebel secretary ministry of petroleum and natural gas government of india and to know what steps india is possibly taking towards appointment of a pso and last but not the least an engaging panel discussion to deliberate and understand the roles and responsibilities of a pso which model could be best suited for india and what are the factors one has to keep in mind to arrive at a specific conclusion so thank you for listening and now i would like to invite mr nicolas from grt gas to share his views on how a tso model was developed and implemented in france thank you okay hello uh let me share my my screen so So, uh, well, thank you for for uh, the um, Asia Gas Partnership Initiative for, for uh, inviting me to to present some view and discuss with with you uh, the perspective uh, of a TSO in in India. I would I'm here to 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 show or explain uh, how we uh, lived it in in France and Europe also. Uh, because it's a very much intertwined context between Europe and, and France. Uh, I'm Nicolas Pagny, I'm from the Strategy and Regulation Department of GRT Gaz, uh, French operator. Uh, so who is uh, GRT Gaz? Uh, well, we are uh, operating a network, a gas network, high pressure in France and Germany. We are in both countries. Um, and in France, we are covering uh, three quarters of France. The south of France is operated by our colleagues from Terica. Uh, where our um, network, we are also owner of LNG, which is uh, operating LNG terminals in south of France and uh, west of France. We uh, operate, we are 3,000 employees and operating 32,000 kilometers of pipelines, which makes it one of the biggest in Europe. We are uh, close with Italian uh, colleagues uh, discussing uh, who has uh, kilometers of pipeline. We operate uh, with this pipeline, we transport 700 uh, terawatt hour per year of gas, partly uh, the main part 450 for delivery to France, another part, the rest going through Switzerland towards Italy or uh, through our colleagues in the Southwest towards Spain. Uh, we are a consolidated um, um, subsidiary of NG, which is a uh, energy group. So as uh, Ankit explained, we are an ITO uh, to ensure a separation between our monopolistic uh, transmission activities and the uh, commercial activities of NG. We also have the state as a 25% roughly uh, shareholder uh, bit of the, uh, with, the, with the employees. Uh, so how did we, uh, how did we move and accompany with a TSO um, the, the opening of the of the market uh, in Europe. Um, it's a long story. Uh, it's more or less a story of the last 20 years in, in Europe uh, in terms of process. So I show you here the pace which is given by the European um, directives. 
they are aiming at creating an integrated uh, energy market across Europe, uh, going from previously country by country in the uh, markets. Uh, so the first directive was 98. Uh, then uh, some years later, in 2003, came the next one. And the last one in 2009 is the one we are uh, living in and we are implementing at the moment. What happens between Europe and France, uh, you, I don't know if you're familiar, but directives at the European level need to be transferred into the local right in France. So as you can see, the time is getting quicker and quicker between uh, directive and implementation showing that uh, the start the start is hard but then it, it moves quicker what it means for the for the company we move from uh, gas de france which was an integrated company so uh, uh, sourcing transporting distributing and selling gas into a first stage which was uh, in the first directive uh, Gaz de France Transport, so a, a subsidiary of the of the uh, a branch of the company which was accounting with accounting and bundling, so separate what is uh, the cost of transport, what is the, the the rest of the company. With the following directives, we moved into having our own image, so that's why we are called GRT Gaz, and we have a green background and not a blue like NG. We have to separate the, the image uh, in order to avoid any confusion um, between these two activities of transmission and uh, sales. And finally, in 2012, we got certified as an independent transmission operator, which means adding on a certain difference or so beyond being a separate legal entity, having some uh, more elements of control on how the shareholder uh, acts on the company uh, to avoid that there is any uh, breach of um, of a level playing field between players. And just to, to as far as I'm concerned, I, I leave these different stages in different countries. So uh, one of the questions on whether TSO is implementable or adapted to, to Indian context, I can tell you that the variety of um, states uh, in Europe, so Slovakia, Hang, um, uh, Austria, Germany, we, there are some things which change, but there are some principles which you develop throughout throughout the different different countries. Um, basically, when when you need an operator, it was uh, hinted uh, or explained by by Ankit. One maybe economic is when the scale effect is important and optimization counts. So in the same for, for public transportation, you have a, sort of a natural monopoly. So you need an entity to develop uh, from greenfield or scale up local developments uh, for this uh, network. The second area is to ensure a level playing field between producers, consumers with diverse market power, as long as you are with b2b activity with similar market powers you do not need as much regulation as when you have big big and small players having to share an infrastructure in a sense the tso is the sort of steward of a common good which is used by market participants to run their business and it's also interesting to address cases uh, which the market cannot handle easily we've seen it in in europe so black swans with security of supply, uh, extreme temperatures event in Europe, uh, cold, I mean, gas is used a lot for, for heating. So when there's a cold wave, we have to prepare and carry the attention of the market towards these extreme events, but also for the long-term view, complex system interaction in the new developments in Europe, the tendency to integrate electricity, gas, um, is, is relatively complex and it's operated, or at least the TSOs have to discuss together to, to, to make these two systems work close. Um, energy policies also is a way to uh, which uh, through which a, a TSO can somehow uh, act. Maybe to, to, to explain uh, what we had as an impact on development of, of the market, we need to make a small step on what are the areas of activities of TSOs. 
uh, it's uh, slightly well, similar to, to what uh, Ankit Gupta has said, but there's a system management area, which is more or less uh, virtual or IT based. It's market design, network planning, commercial flow, running the commercial flow, managing the uh, trading point and balancing. It's making its interface to the um, to the users. So uh, sort of day to day, making the market understandable for, for users. So going from complex pipelines to a single sim simple market model and organizing the flows. Then there's a commercial part, which is selling the capacity. So design the capacity product, uh, promote them, sell, contract, and, and, and invoice. Uh, typically in, in Germany, our, our German subsidiary is very much concentrated on, on, that, on that area. And then there's the asset owner between financing, engineering, or, or operation and maintenance, and physical uh, dispatching. These areas are strongly intertwined, but you could, and we've seen in different geographies, different setups. Uh, in France, we have everything within one uh, TSO, so an ITO. Um, in uh, Germany, some of the activities of system management are um, operated by one of the TSOs on behalf of others. Uh, you have the ISO model, which will be more or less the, the first two lines uh, put together. Uh, when we discussed uh, in Mex with colleagues in Mexico, that's more or less uh, one of the aspects they were, they were addressing. In each case, it's important to identify where is the necessary transparency on each activity so that the market players uh, understand and have uh, confidence in the non-discriminatory attitude of the TSO. Um, in France, how, how we did it, so I'll go through these some of these aspects. So the market design, we had a long-term activity of simplifying, making the market model um, easy for, for, uh, for, for shippers so that the, the barrier to, uh, to entry the, model, uh, the, the market would be lower. So from a very complex um, pipeline system where you had to know where you enter your pipeline and where you exit, uh, where you go through, we moved to a system of entry exit zones where we had five zones in France in 2005. And for the subsequent period, so as you've seen 15 years more or less, we simplified it more and more, and we cooperated with our colleagues in the Southwest to operate a single market zone. It means for a shipper, France is a big gas pool where you enter gas wherever, uh, let's say on, on an LNG terminal and you deliver to your customer. This simplification is a duty or a task of the TSO, which makes it easier for industry who do not need to be gas specialists to access the market. You can be an industrial and you say, I buy gas on the virtual point and I take it to my plant and it's relatively easy and the logistics is done by the TSOs. Um, next part is overview of the planning. So to, to implement this mm, simplification, we need of course to have the infrastructure which is working with that. So we have a strong European and French uh, stakeholder involvement to decide and uh, how to make this market evolve, uh, which solution to merge the markets into one entry exit zone, for example. Um, in the last merger, we decided with the market to invest, to have a mixture of investment, which of course go into the tariff, and market mechanism for a, a specific cases where it was not worth investing. It would be too much burden on the tariff, but still we needed to have the, the system working. So that's really a, a strong interaction. We spend a lot of time interacting with the stakeholders and of course, under the auspices of the regulator uh, to, to de develop this uh, system and uh, see how the tariff and the investment uh, develop. Um, on the more short, term view and also in relation to the market, the capacity allocation, so the, the sale of capacity, um, we developed with other European operators, uh, Prisma platform, which is a sort of one face to the customer so that the customer, although they are one, 
several TSOs per country uh, have a single point where they can book the capacity uh, with a transparent mechanism, where, so uh, an, an auction mechanism. Also on a day-to-day, -day, the TSO is also participating in the life of the market because when shippers are not balanced, so they enter more than they withdraw or vice versa, we give them an overview of where is the situation of the market because at the end of the day, there is this reconciliation and we operate it in close coordination with PowerNex, which is the, the exchange uh, to have a market-based um, balancing mechanism, uh, which is also bringing liquidity into the market. We also have a duty of transparency and visibility to, to shippers. So we also give an outlook because each shipper know on, only their portfolio. So we aggregate their, their portfolio and the, the forecast to give a view if the, how the winter or summer will look like, will uh, the network and the status of the storages be sufficient to fill in the storage to enter winter in good conditions. And we also have a, a big flow of information uh, on market messages if we have uh, some pipeline out of order for some time. So we need to inform the market and we need to uh, give a transparency to all, all the market participants. So as you can see, the, the TSO plays a, a big ro ro role or in facilitating the market and its evolution. It's a long discussion with the, the regulator and the stakeholders. Um, just to, to summarize and also make a, some unashamed advertising, uh, we, we, in, in a TSO, you have a combination of know-how, of technical know-how, project management, operation, regulation, marketing, uh, how to market the capacity. You have, even have R&D because uh, some, at some point we realized the market would not uh, be mature enough to address R and D uh, in some in some areas because market participants are concentrating on on their market share. Uh, it's something which is in, play, uh, in all the system uh, investment cycles, so from acquisition, transition, and so on. And we are happy to to share and discuss uh, these um, findings or our experience with colleagues uh, across the, the the world because. First, in different geographies, you have to adapt your own and develop your own model, of course. And it's always good as a feedback for us to question our model and also uh, in developing new areas, like for example, at the moment, the question of hydrogen uh, network development is a big question in Europe. And we, of course, do not start from the same status of gas. Therefore, having exchange across the globe with our peers is really a, a good, um, a good opportunity for 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 us to to work together so i'm happy to to answer questions and i'm almost uh, okay with the 15 minutes so i can i think give back the the floor uh i think for Ms. minister kapoor if i'm if i'm right thank you nicholas very much um Mr. Kapoor will be joining us in approximately 15 minutes. So what we're going to do is go ahead and start the panel discussion. Um, and then when the secretary joins us, we'll, we'll, we'll break and uh, let him do his keynote remarks. So I will hand over the floor to Mr. Um, Kapreet Chok from ICF. Thank you, and Sarah. I hope you can hear me. We can. And um, Nicola, could you unshare your screen or Gurpreet, you take over? I can certainly take over and that's I think that's a screen gone so great so uh, thank you Sarah and uh, thank you Nicola for uh, an excellent description of what GRT gas uh, has been through and the journey that uh, it has been through over these so many years certainly a long journey but something that has made an impact. Uh, so while we you know, wait for the uh, Honorable Secretary to uh, join us, we thought we will begin with the panel discussion uh, and maybe stop in between to welcome him when he joins. So let me first introduce our glittering panel today and you know I'll do it alphabetically. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Mr. Akhil Mehrotra, a CEO, Pipeline Infrastructure Limited. He's a business leader with more than 29 years of experience spread across the oil and gas, power and telecom industries. And for a number of years now in leadership roles, 
He has contributed towards drafting several electricity and gas sector regulations and has been instrumental um, in, in many of the changes that have happened in the Indian gas sector. Before joining Pipeline Infrastructure Limited as CEO, Akhil was associated with Shell, uh, BG, Gujarat Gas and Reliance Group. Welcome, Akhil. Next, we have Mr. Ashu Shingal, uh, Chief General Manager, Corporate Strategy uh, at Gale. Mr. Singhal uh, is a mechanical engineer and an MBA. Uh, he's presently heading corporate strategy, planning advocacy function at Gale as chief general manager, and also serves as director on the board of Opal, ONGC Petro Editions Limited. He has served terms as director on the board of Talcher Fertilizers in Mahanagar Gas. So not only does he know about gas, but also the many consuming industries where gas goes. So welcome uh, Ashuji to this uh, panel. Next, we have uh, Mr. Jean-Marc Brimont, uh, Head of EU Affairs, uh, permanent representative in Brussels from GRT Gas. He has more than 20 years of experience in the gas business in Europe and Asia. Uh, he created GRT Gas's representation in Brussels in 2018 and currently in charge of European affairs, supporting the company effort to advocate for and, and promote future role of renewable and low carbon gases. Welcome to this uh, round table. Mr. S.C. Gupta, Joint Advisor, Petroleum and Natural Gas Regulatory Board. Uh, more than 30 years of experience in the oil and gas industries, in operations, infrastructure, development, inspection, and many other activities um, in BPCL earlier and now with PNGRB as Joint Advisor. He looks after the development of gas infrastructure in India, authorization of CGD networks, uh, and uh, natural gas and petroleum product pipelines with access for common carrier. There couldn't be a better person from PNGRB to talk about the issues that, that we have at hand. Welcome, Mr. Gupta, to this um, panel discussion. So, uh, you know, let, let us begin the panel discussion. And, uh, you know, maybe first I would really request moving on from Nicola, I'd, I'd request uh, Jean Marc to come in. And you know, just uh, expand a little bit about the experiences in France. And you know, we also noticed that there was a question uh, in the in in the Q and A as well relating to this. And so, you know, it'll be great if you can talk about the experiences uh, in France and how uh, the current structure is different, let's say, from a fully unbundled structure that we see in the UK. And what have what have been the pros and cons, uh, according to you, of the different structures uh, that that you've seen? So, over to you for your thoughts, please. So well, thank you for, for giving me the floor and thank you very much uh, for inviting me today. Um, indeed, uh, uh, GIT Gas uh, is one of the two TSOs we have in France. We also operate energy terminals. And the other TSO in France uh, has got a different structure when it comes to unbundling. It's actually uh, uh, within the ownership unbundling structure. So um, to be very clear, actually, uh, this choice of uh, uh, going for um, independent uh, uh, transmission uh, officer ITO model was something that has been pushed uh, by France uh, during the negotiation that took place um, uh, when the, the third gas directive was set. And this was, uh, this was considered as, the, as an alternative uh, road to what was proposed to the Commission. Uh, the European Commission, which is very much in favor of, uh, of uh, ownership and bundling. So if you look, if you look for, from a, a very global perspective uh, and look uh, what, what, we, what we see in Europe, actually, uh, I recently uh, looked at a report that was prepared by the Council of European Energy Regulator. So, so that's uh, some kind of club of uh, energy regulator in Europe. So if you look globally, actually, uh, in the electric system, uh, most of the, the TSOs are actually under the ownership unbundling model. 70% of them actually have chosen this model. If you look at gas, actually, 40% uh, of the TSOs have chosen to be on the ownership uh, unbundling, but 44% have cho chosen the ITO model. So there's quite a lot of, uh, of TSOs that are actually uh, in gas within, uh, within this ITO model. We see also uh, this ISO model that you have described earlier that is also, also um, represented, but uh, um, it's a bit more smaller in numbers. Um, I have to say that actually uh, uh, you have to, to look at when you when choosing or evaluating pro of cons, you have to, to look at the, the situation that your incumbent company is in. So actually for, for, for Gas de France, uh, it, was, uh, it was essential to keep the value creation from infrastructure uh, within the group. So that's why this choice was made to go for the ITO model. 
if you look at Terega, which is actually a former Total subsidiary, the choice has been different. Total has stepped out from the Tour de Table, and now we have another Italian shareholder, so they have gone uh, for uh, uh, an ownership in Belgium. So you have to understand that uh, from a market perspective, there's not that much difference uh, for between having an ITO or having uh, an, ownership, an ownership and building, uh, as long as the regulator is doing his job. So you have to actually to make sure that you have a strong regulator that is capable to ensure that conflict of interest between producers, suppliers, and transition system operators are solved. And that actually the incentives for necessary investments are there because that's the challenge actually India will face as well. Uh, and if you have someone in uh, ownership and building or, 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 or weak uh, ITO, you can suspect that it could actually delay some investment and hamper market development. So that's really challenging. The third point that is very important actually for the regulator is actually to ensure that the, 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 access, to, the access to the market is transparent and efficient. So that's also the, the challenge. So frankly, uh, frankly uh, from a market perspective, as long as the regulator is doing his job, no problem. But for, for, the, for the vertically integrated companies, so our shareholders, it's, it's quite heavy. Uh, to have, a, to have a, an ITO because actually uh, the ITO has got its own resources. So actually you, you do not mutualize any uh, corporate resources with uh, the, the group. So you have to have your own uh, IT, uh, your own department, your own purchase department. Uh, so all the internal services are actually uh, uh, internal from, from, from the ITO. You have to have um, uh, on top of a, co a corporate identity that has to be uh, separated from the group, you actually have to, uh, to, to rely on the regulator for on investment planning. So actually the, the governing board cannot uh, validate uh, one uh, specific investment, but rather investment plan. Um, the regulation you have is, uh, is quite heavy and the monitoring by the NRA uh, on the certification that, uh, that Nicola has mentioned is actually heavy on a day-to-day -day basis. We have a compliance officer within the company that is actually ensuring that um, the ITO model is properly uh, implemented. Um, so honestly, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an exercise that requires uh, cooperation with a regulator and takes time actually uh, to build trust and actually to make sure that actually things are working properly. But now I think after more than, uh, than 20 years of, of practice, uh, things are, are going smoothly and uh, I think we have achieved uh, our, our market our internal market, so it's a, it's a success. Thank you, thank you so much, John Mark. And uh, I think some great points there and some data as well. Almost you said 44% have chosen the ITO model and 40% chosen the uh, ownership unbundling. So I guess, you know, the important point is that the choice was there, but also uh, noted when you said that it is not just uh, unbundling, but it is clear separation, functional separation, you know, how the companies operate, the resources they have, have to be completely different. So thank you for those uh, opening remarks and you know very valuable um, knowledge from uh, the experiences that you have. Next, I'm going to go to uh, Mr. S.C. Gupta, uh, and uh, you know, Mr. Gupta, my question for you is, you know, from the perspective of PNGRB, uh, if a new transmission system operator is created, what would be the roles and responsibilities uh, of this transmission system operator? Mr. Gupta, you're on mute. So if you can unmute yourself, please. And uh, I was just going to request uh, Sarah to let us know, you know, when uh, the Honorable Secretary comes in and then we can take a pause. Thank you, Gurpreet. And also I thank the USEA and AGP for inviting us for this very timely seminar with respect to transmission system operations. In India, as you are aware that we already have authorized 32,000 kilometer of pipeline. Out of this 17,000 kilometer of pipeline is in operation and 15,000 kilometers of the pipeline is under the process of laying. And looking at the objective of the government, which is in sync with the PNGRB objective that we have to make a gas-based economy. First place is we have to have infrastructure across the country. And for that purpose, it has been observed that with the laying of this 32,000 kilometer of pipeline, and some additional pipelines, the national gas grade will be almost complete. So it means the infrastructure will be available. And besides for use of that infrastructure, we have already authorized 
more than 70% of the population will have access to CGD network. And we also are in the process of giving further CGD bidding rounds so that almost the entire population of this country will have access to the gas. Now we will have the infrastructure and we also have the consumers, but how to manage this infrastructure? It has been observed that we in the past also had regulations with respect to the access for common carrier as well as contract carrier. But with so many multiple entities operating various pipelines and multiple operators are there and multiple consumers are there. So for that, doing that, PNGRB has envisaged that we should have an independent system operator. When I say independent system operator, it will be a model that this is a third party which is not engaged in any other business. So they will be totally independent from the existing entities. And this independent system operator will be similar on the lines of POSCO, which we have for the power system. We have a power generating companies, other companies, but the system is managed through POSCO. This independent system operator will have all the rules which are being defined like First is the collection of the data. That is the data has to be collected in line with the regulations and it is displayed on gas access bulletin board. So the transparency is must for this operator and this data will be real time basis. Now this independent system operator will also have to do the network planning and accordingly they have to, beyond the planning, they have to carry out the booking for both common as well as contract carrier for the natural gas pipeline. It has to understand the technical and operational aspects of the system to ensure that these are not breached. So pipeline are operated in a very safe manner in line with the extent regulations. It has to submit, nominate, scheduling, all these things, flow curtailment, everything has to be undertaken by this operator. Recently, we have also updated our regulation with respect to imbalance management services wherein we have allowed parking, lending, netting, trading, all these activities are to be managed through this independent operator. So in a true sense, we are expecting that this independent system operator should be able, will be an independent entity and would be able to manage the whole network of the pipeline through transparent allocation of the capacity and the challenges which are faced by the entities today in respect of that they have to handle through various different type of GT, GTAs with different entities that will be standardized and the access will be available in a very fair and transparent manner. That is the prime objective. And we are also in the process of uploading this draft regulations on our website. It may be possible that it, uh, these are uploaded in the next two to three weeks time for public consultation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. And I think, uh, like you said, infrastructure is important and soon we should have the national gas grid in place. So the infrastructure will get built. And I think this aligns with the earlier point that John Mark men uh, mentioned, that the investment is really important and you know the model should be such that it should make the investment come. So thank you for your thoughts. And we really look forward to these draft regulations you know, uh, when they are going to come out. And thanks also for clarifying you know, what uh, the independent TSO you have in mind, especially for our audience who uh, are trying to understand what this concept means for them. I, I'd now like to uh, you know, request uh, Ashu Singhalji uh, to uh, maybe come in here and uh, share uh, his thoughts uh, being part of Gale, the largest transmission and marketing company in India. And Ashuji, as you know, you've heard um, through this presentation that TSOs have been implemented in many different forms in different parts of the world. Even within EU, there are different models and TSOs have chosen those models. Um, Mr. Gupta has talked about the model that they're thinking about in India. What are your views as uh, a nationally owned company and the largest transmission and marketing company about the ap appropriate model for TSO uh, that you see going forward uh, for India? Thank you, Gurpreet. I'm honored to be part of this distinguished panel, as well as I'd like to thank the organizers for giving this opportunity to interact. <clears throat> so as a lot of uh, background has been set up of what the roles of TSOs are and uh, what type of models are available. Now, coming back to what Gurpreet, you have asked specifically, is that uh, we 100% agree with what the government is planning to do to create an independent body which will play the role of uh, TSO. But before coming to that, I would like to highlight that each country is unique. 
there are different models adopted by different countries and each country has to devise their own mechanism and the best model which is suited for them like to elaborate it further i would like to say that uh, in india we have uh, infrastructure which is under development as was pointed out by ankit and uh, mr gupta also that close to 18000 km pipeline is already operational and another 13 14000 will be operational by 3 4 years time so it's under development stage i will say and uh, another thing is the market is not very much mature to set, uh, to support the development of pipeline into the economy economical areas where there are no anchor customers so that needs to be kept in mind when we do the reforms in uh, any sector second is the market development where we address the issue of gas affordability and other related issues third is the open access and transparency which is required in a, any transmission system for building up the confidence which is required by the customers suppliers and various stakeholders and fourthly the value maximization for the all the stakeholders by each each operator which is working as well as to in, attract more investment in the system now these are broader perspective which each country will have a look at to carry out its reform and there has to be sequencing and reform now uh, i will agree to it that uh, the time is apt for uh, bringing out this reform in transport system operator and it should be an independent agency because otherwise there are three systems which as uh, ankit explained that one is ito iso and ownership and bargain but when we talk about eu model also they have given the option to the countries and each country has adopted their own system based on their uniqueness like 44% have gone for ito what here we are saying is maybe slightly uh, in a different model as a more of a independent uh, company altogether which will play the role of uh, trans transmission system operator which will be a government company and uh, that will do all the roles which are required for tso so in my view this is the right model to adopt for the country in the time for as of now one more thing i would like to highlight the difference between maybe europe as well as us is that in india abnisho there are different players working in different sectors just to uh, throw more light on it is that when we talk about unbundling in us or in europe there were one entity which was active both in upstream midstream and downstream sectors whereas in india from the beginning we have multiple players in the upstream part who are producing gas and giving it there are different many transporters who are laying pipelines and operating them and obviously there are different uh, downstream players ccgd companies and various industries who are taking gas from it so uh, uh, i what i want to say is that there is a lot of transparency already there in the system there is not a single operator or an agency or an entity which is working in all the three systems so i will agree with what the government is uh, planning to bring the tso so i will stop here and hand it over to you gripit thank you thank you ashish ji for your thoughts and like you said every country is unique and i think thanks for also pointing out the differences for india where we've always had separate upstream companies midstream and downstream whereas that might not have been the case earlier in many of the western markets so uh, yeah th- I, and and to me it seems that you know uh, gale is also therefore supportive of this uh, new model where this is be an independent entity looking at the overall operations uh, for um, the uh, gas pipeline transmission network so uh, next uh, let me come to uh, akhil uh, akhil then if i can request you to turn on your video uh, and you know again from a perspective of a private sector pipeline only company uh, i wanted to get your thoughts also on the same question because i think uh, the most important thing right now is what is the right model for india and we also have a question in the q and a where people are asking what do existing companies think about this model so do you agree with these models what are your thoughts you know of the right tso model for india the independent transmission operator versus unbundling how do you look at this whole issue akhil uh, thanks to preet and uh, uh, happy to be talking to such a distinguished uh, people uh, basically and uh, for the sake of repetition let me also repeat what are the objectives of uh, setting up a, a tso or iso whatever you want to call it kind of and there are only four five objectives which we have to keep in mind and and the first one is and everybody has spoken about it is transparency and efficiency getting non discriminatory open access uh, possibly ease of booking of uh, capacity uh, by shippers and also giving this multiple pipeline uh, um, into one integrated uh, uh, place to manage kind of 
and as well as uh, uh, market balancing at some stage when the market is a much more mature kind of. So keeping all that in view, kind of uh, this is, and this is not different from any country. The India also needs all this as any other country needs that. Uh, all this, what will help to achieve is, it will help to achieve the broader objective of promoting gas on gas competition, as well as take the share of gas from say 6% to 15% in how many years and the various views on that. Now, having said that, there are broadly people have talked of uh, uh, multiple models uh, of, of having a system operator. There were, broadly, in my view, there are only two models. One is it is an independent transmission operator or it's an independent system operator. When we call of independent transmission operator, that can be uh, a entity which is unbundled. Uh, now within that unbundling, either uh, the transmission company is an affiliate or it's a total illegal unbundling. So there can be two variations of that. And the next version is where you have an independent system operator where it's a completely independent entity, which uh, our panelists have spoken about and which kind of manages this. Now, if you see India, where we are, we have multiple pipeline operators, three largest one, as you spoke of, Yale, GSPL, and PIL. As PIL, if I can say, we are already an independent transmission operator, right? If you see the European model, by that definition, we already operate this pipeline as independent because we have no uh, kind of uh, uh, say in, uh, we don't have market cash, kind of, right? So the other two entities, which the two, so if you talk of ITOs, and in, then you have to unbundle Gale and GSPL and uh, bring that. In absence of that, the next best model is to go to an ISO, which is the independent system operator. Right? Now, having said, uh, you asked what is best for India. Now, if given the circumstances and given what we are, we're developing new pipelines also, and Gale is supposed to do that, we can go for a independent system operator. Now, with an independent system operator, there can be two versions. One is who owns this kind of thing, right? kind of uh, one is as uh, PNGRB and Mr. Gupta has spoken about that the possibly government can own it, right? So that's also uh, fine. And as long as there is a, a regulatory overlay on that and it's uh, uh, kind of managed independently, fantastic. Other model is, which is much more simpler if uh, the regulators want to do it is uh, bring in uh, the, the uh, all the owners of the pipeline jointly own that and uh, operate it kind of in a very transparent and independent way. Now, we can follow either of these models for India uh, as an ISO or independent system operator, but few things need to be remembered, and I want to bring it to the table for everybody to discuss, is that while we do that, and, and uh, it's very important that, uh, one, the current access code, we have a fresh look at and see the current access code, which was made, I think, 15 years back. Uh, is it fit for purpose? And, and do we really want to uh, give more teeth to this ISO? So that when, when a shipper comes for access of gas, then uh, basically kind of he's not uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, refused uh, capacity in light of any say congestions are happening or something else kind of. Right? There are many technical issues which can be raised. And why I'm saying that is, I'm assuming in India we'll still have unbundled entities uh, to deal with. Kind of, right? So to deal with that for India, I think we need to have a very robust access code, and we can look at that and see we can follow the UK model or European model or US model for access code. So that needs to be looked at and see if that works uh, for us uh, while we have bundle entities at one end, also uh, independent companies like us kind of. Right? And also uh, while this um, uh, kind of ISO is being talked of, I think the structure should be such that it benefits the shipper. It will take some time. We need to integrate all the networks of these companies into one control room. Uh, there are cyber security issues which has to be looked into, which softwares will be used. So I'm not talking a lot of technicalities which will come. Uh, we have been discussing with various stakeholders. So I'm bringing that point also becomes very important in these days that how do you ensure that is a safe, safety is not compromised of each pipeline operator kind of. Uh, so I'll not repeat the roles and responsibilities. I partly agree with what Mr. Gupta said that, okay, the role of this ISO can be um, obviously uh, bringing the data transparently on the websites, uh, uh, kind of uh, real-time data should be the best kind of to go with so that shippers can see where the capacity is available and they can ask for that uh, capacity to be booked. Since we also have now unified tariff coming and uh, if uh, I think the, for um, uh, the participants who don't know, in unified tariff, 
the entity which actually is connected to a customer will do the billing. So in this case, a lot of billing issues will come. So this entity can also look at really uh, kind of invoicing and kind of collection of uh, uh, the revenue so that they can, uh, there will be pipelines which will have surplus revenue and there'll be pipeline which have deficit revenues. So this uh, uh, kind of um, interchange of money can happen through an escrow account, which can also be handled by an ISO. Kind of. So various functions can be uh, uh, kind of performed by an ISO, but I believe that for India to go about, I think ISO is the best model, uh, uh, light-handed approach, and then it can be strengthened as we go along. Thank you. Thanks so much, Akhil. And you know, uh, I'm glad to see that it, uh, all, all of the pa panelists and everyone kind of agrees that the model that we are thinking about in India, which is the independent system operator, is uh, you know something that will work with everyone. So that perhaps answers some of our audience's question also, that this is a possibly the appropriate model. But certainly take your point that you, know, it, you really will have to get into the weeds for this because there'll be too many uh, things, operational things to take care of. You know, the access code, the data gathering, the billing, you know, how do you do it? So there is certainly as you know a lot of role that uh, the ngrb also has in setting these regulations and then you know with the oversight so thanks akhil uh, for those thoughts but akhil you know i'd like to maybe remain with you for the next question uh, and i wanted to ask you you know since you are as you said you are perhaps the only uh, completely unbundled uh, entity only offering transmission services can you talk a little bit about you know the capacity services that you're offering is it very simply right now long term capacity take or pay book and and that's what or you are offering other products capacity products in the market how do you see these capacity products evolving in future also keeping in mind that we now have the India gas exchange and you know the, the people will need access to gas. Uh, idly, you should have, you should people, power plants should be able to buy gas from the exchange, have pipeline capacity and sell it, the power on the power exchange as well. So, you know, to enable that kind of, uh, you know, uh, seamless uh, integration, what products as a company you think you will be offering or that might start to get in, into the market? Uh, so uh, I'll summarize of what we are doing and obviously we should remember that as a, as, a, as a monopoly company and as a company regulated by PNGRB, we can on, only offer those products which are allowed by the regulator. Uh, having said that, I think uh, uh, we have set ourselves on a journey. Uh, obviously, what we do today is always we are providing non-discriminatory access. We have huge capacity, which is idle on a pipeline, and, uh, and our audience know the reason for that. Um, uh, hence, we have no problem in giving capacity anywhere, anytime. Uh, I have been speaking in various forums that we want to increase our revenue. So we take the capacity when you want kind of, right? Uh, we, uh, we are working on and, and we're doing a lot of things to really make our services uh, more efficient and more uh, user-friendly for the customers. Uh, we at oil and gas industry has been notorious not to make it because it was B2B. Uh, so so uh, what we have set ourselves into so that we handle our customers while smaller customers are onboarded these days. Uh, uh, we, we work on a deadline to sign contracts. We also uh, uh, kind of are developing uh, uh, various uh, uh, new products. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, uh, the shippers would know we were the only company which was offering, although in the regulatory system, the deferred delivery services where customers can come and store gas and take it later. Uh, that was as per the regulation. And we had pushed a lot. And now we're happy that there's a regulation which has come on uh, which, which uh, for imbalance management services, which allow parking, uh, lending of gas. So all that will help development of uh, 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 um, kind of a trading of gas much better along with IGX kind of. Uh, so so uh, setting up of IGX along with this whole imbalance management services and we have started giving it immediately. Happy to, I think most of the pipelines will do that uh, uh, kind of as we go about. More importantly, I think the demand from the industry is like currently, if you need capacity, it just need uh, it, it's on a T plus two or T plus three basis. Can I give capacity on a day head basis, uh, on the same day basis? So we are developing ourselves, our capabilities, irrespective of ISO, whether whenever it comes, you will find PIL giving capacities on a day head basis very soon. Uh, kind of we have uh, on a smaller things we can give uh, as long as the financials are clear and, and the LC is in place. Uh, we can give capacity on a very quick basis. So as far as we are concerned, our revenues depend on customers by selling capacities. Uh, we are developing a lot of IT solutions internally within PIL to ensure that uh, within one year, if not earlier, 
the customers uh, will have a better experience dealing with us. They can book capacities online. They can deal with any queries online. We like to have standard contracts for short-term capacities. Uh, obviously, I'm hoping at some stage uh, the, the regulator starts allowing capacity trading also or release of capacity. So all that will be done as long as um, uh, our revenues increases that that's uh, what we want here. Yeah. Thank you, Akhil. And, you know, very pleased to hear those thoughts. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you'll be pioneering all these different uh, capacity products that, that could come in the market. And I wish you luck in that. And certainly, you know, uh, we have the regulator here uh, and, you know, they, they're, they're listening to it. They need to see, they need to allow these new products to come into the market to the, for the market to start functioning. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll next go go back to uh, Ashuji. Uh, I'll come back to you now. And, um, you know, Gail currently has um, the largest share of pipeline, uh, or, well, very large pipeline. Some of it are almost 100% uh, full. Some of them are at a lower capacity utilization. Can you, you know, talk about some of the um, products that you have or you're planning to bring into the market, which may be capacity only products? For these pipelines, how are you offering capacity in the market? If you could, you know, talk about some of those uh, initiatives, I think that will be great for our audience to listen to. Sure, Gurpit. I think uh, what Mr. Akhile said, some of those things we are also looking at. But just to uh, bring more uh, right perspective into it, as of now, the regulation says that on the first of every month we have to declare in a prescribed format the available capacity and uh, what is the places where it is available. But uh, as a proactive member, Gail has already gone ahead and two and a half years back, we have launched open access portal, wherein uh, anybody can book the capacity much in as per the regulations and they can see what is the available capacity and they can always book almost a day ahead capacity due to it. So a lot of flexibility is available with the customer to see which are the pipelines, where the capacity is available and what points they can book in. The tariff is anyway regulated by the PNGRB, so there is no variation in the charging of tariff and it is transparently available for everybody to see the capacity available and very easily they can go and start booking it. Now coming to the other points, whatever new ways of promoting this whole thing is that we are looking at various models, various options which are available within the regulations and we are also having an eye at what are the different changes which draft regulations which the PNGRB has put on uh, on uh, for consultation purposes. So we are already in sync with it and we will be definitely updating ourselves with uh, whatever is the market requirement and whatever the operators which are asking, which are, which are being offered into the whole transportation, transportation system, as well as we are also trying to align with the customer's requirement because there are different customers who want different type of uh, products. And more or less we are meeting their demands. It's just, I would like to share that 25% is the capacity which is required mandatorily by the PNGRB to, to given common carrier basis. We are, uh, we are having that common carrier capacity available for uh, anybody to book and only eight to 9% is currently being booked. So there's a huge gap between 25% uh, to 9%. So we have spare capacity which is available in the 25% common carrier capacity. And also all the 75 to 75% uh, 75 which is the contract carrier capacity beyond one year duration. There also the capacity utilization is low because on overall basis we are having gas capacity utilization of the pipelines close to 50%. So there also the capacity is more or less available. What you were earlier mentioning in your remark is that there are few pipeline lakes where the capacity is more than 75%. But those are very few in numbers. In all other pipelines, most of the pipelines which are newly built, they are running at 10% capacity. So there is, no, uh, there is no reason or argument for us to not give access to anybody. We are open to all players and we are most uh, welcome to book the capacity. We try to adopt to the requirements that this customer needs. And just to throw some light on the open access portal, more than 4,000 bookings have come. And to my knowledge, not a single booking has been refused. On, uh, on for, for any customer to book their capacity on our system. So we are very open to it because it is definitely a very, I mean, there's no brainer that we want our uh, pipelines to be better optimally utilized because as per regulations and as per the PNGRB also, the tariff calculation is such that up to 75% normative uh, buildup is there. 
So if we are under utilizing below 75%, we are under recovering uh, from the pipeline assets. So anything from uh, lower than 75% up to 75% is the upside to the company. So, I mean, it's very much in our interest, in the interest of the market, in the interest of all stakeholders, customers, government, as well as the government's vision to take the economy, gas-based economy, like taking from 6 to 15%. So we are in sync with it. And as soon as some regulations are more modified, like capacity trading and parking and lending and line pack utilization, imbalance charges, if some changes are made in the regulation, we will be always eager to help the market grow in that direction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashuji. So I think the clear message coming from you and Akhil that there is capacity on pipelines and the pipeline owners are uh, keen and willing to offer capacity only products in the market. So uh, sure, great signs for customers and, and shippers to be able to book that capacity and trade uh, gas on it. Uh, next, uh, let me come to Jean-Marc and uh, I have a question for you uh, around the French structure where, you know, there are two TSOs we understand in, in France. Uh, and if we try and draw a loose parallel in India, there are multiple pipeline owners and operators. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, any challenges that were faced in France or currently being faced when it comes to these two different TSOs and how do they interface with each other? What does, you know, how does a regulator uh, come into the picture or your general uh, learnings from two different entities integrating with each other and operating? What what are the learnings that, that you'd like to share with the, the audience here? Okay, so thanks a lot uh, for bringing that question up. Actually, it's very interesting. Uh, so today in France, we have one single commercial model. So we have one single entry, entry exit system, uh, which is common to both TSOs. So the customers are seeing only one zone, if you like, for France, while we still have two operators. So things have not been that easy, actually, uh, to get there. And it took us uh, uh, almost 10 years to, to make all the investments and to prepare all the... Um, the, the IT uh, layer actually to, to get that ready. So um, I'm not going to go through all the, the steps uh, that, that have taken us there, but I'm going to, to try to explain you why we did that. So I think agreeing on the why is very important actually. So what we have tried to do in France is to promote gas to gas competition on the wholesale market. So um, what, we, what we were trying to achieve is more price and transparency uh, and more convergence of prices between marketplaces in Europe, but also in France, because most of the time, due to the congestion we had, we had actually different prices in different regions of France. When you look at France, it's not that big, it's not very acceptable. So that was also, that was the main objective, uh, to have more price transparency and more price convergence. The second objective was also to create more market mechanisms for, for, for wholesale players to have more capa capability to trade. So um, we, we made a lot of, uh, we developed a lot of products, uh, as it was mentioned before, uh, long term, short term uh, market mechanisms actually to, to allow uh, smooth trading. So one, once, we had, once we had agreed on the, on the why, the question was, how do that? And, and there, the, the discussion very quickly uh, landed on, on a definition of a target model, which was actually defining how the, the market should look like. Uh, at a certain horizon of time, and also defining the rules of games uh, that needs to be implemented. So balancing, uh, capacity booking mechanisms, and also tariff, uh, tariff setting. So this, this, this long-term objective was actually giving a lot of visibility to the, to the market players and allowed also to plan for investments. So we had investments actually to be made to actually enhance uh, interconnection capacities with, with other countries, but also we had to solve internal congestions. So um, this planning was important because uh, we had to consult the market to understand what kind of capacity needs uh, were, were actually uh, uh, present over the long term, but also solve congestions. And there, this exercise to plan was actually important to see what were the funding gaps uh, we could observe and what kind of support we, we would need from, from the government and also from the European level. So it has led to, to, uh, to an ambitious uh, investment plan of 7 billion for, for JRT gas, uh, some of which has been supported by EU funds. So this planning exercise was key. 
Uh, and as you know, in transmission, uh, the devil is always uh, hiding in the details. So building the network codes was also key. And there, the consultation with, uh, with market players uh, have been very important. So I would just would like to highlight three aspects that, for me, are quite important if you want to, to make this uh, market integration successful for India. I think the capacity booking rules are very important because this is actually the, the window uh, you give to, uh, to, to shippers and to, to customers that are willing to, 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 to enter the, the gas market, the Indian market. The, the variety of products and the simplicity of the rules are actually key actually to attract those players. A second issue is balancing. Uh, we struggled uh, a lot in the beginning because we had separated uh, balancing regimes with uh, separate, separate rendezvous during the day to settle imbalances. So it was a little bit unoptimal for, for, for market players. So converging uh, on a balancing regime that is unique or unified, harmonized on the whole India would, in my opinion, help. And market-based balancing has proved, uh, at least uh, in, in France and in Europe, to be very efficient to allow actually um, shippers to, to solve their, their imbalances at a market price and at, at a competitive price. Uh, but CSOs are only intervening for, 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 for very marginal intervention on residual balancing. So that's also contributing uh, to, the, to the overall balance of the system and to the security, uh, to the security uh, of, of, of supply. Tarification also is important. Uh, you know, with, with two TSOs, we already had some pancaking. Uh, and when you had to ship gas from um, Norway all the way to, to France, sometimes you had a very complex set of tariffs actually to, 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 uh, to sum, and that was very complex actually for, for players. So tarification is a third point that is very important. Transparency uh, on how uh, tariffs are set, are set and the level of price, how they are, they are, they are, they are, they are implemented uh, is very important. And I think at some point in time, harmonization in Europe and defining actually this model of, uh, of postage stamp and capacity weighted uh, model was actually very helpful actually to converge for France. So that was my, my key my key messages on that. Uh, sure, thank you. Thank you. And I think some excellent points there. Uh, you know, what, what I took away from it is as far as the customer is concerned, you know, keep it simple, keep the tariff simple, uh, provide them many products, make the booking rules easy, but very important to have the right access rules, the right network code that enables coordination between different operators. So as far as customers are concerned, keep the tariff and keep the rules simple, uh, regulate the owners and uh, ensure that there are defined set rules which are known to everyone and they complement uh, the regulatory regime. Thank you, thank you so much, John Mark, for, for your points. Uh, now let me come to uh, Mr. Uh, Gupta, and uh, you know uh, you already talked about that there are regulations that you are thinking about uh, at PNGRB, where uh, and something may be coming out uh, in the near future uh, around imbalance management. Uh, so you know, can you talk about uh, any of the other regulations or any other thinking that PNGRB has specifically around the issues raised, like you know, drafting these network codes, uniform access code. Uh, we know that you know tariff uh, reform is anyway on the anvil with unified tariff for for customers. But in terms of the inter se operation between different companies, uh, can you shed some light on the regulations that are being planned, uh, Mr. Gupta? Uh, Mr. Gurpreet, would you repeat your question? Because uh, in between, sure. I lost the connection. No problem. So I was just saying that, you know, uh... We, you already talked about the uh, regulation on imbalance management that uh, PNGRB may be coming out with. I was wondering if there's any thinking around uh, the, especially the network codes, uh, like you know, we heard the previous speakers talk about the importance of having the right network codes because there are different companies that are going to operate pipelines and the TSO will kind of you know um, bring them together. So they all talked about the importance of having a very set, robust set of network code to enable operation. So is, is there any thinking in around this in PNGRB? Uh, are you looking at developing these codes, or you know, if you can talk a little bit about uh, the how uh, you know you you would be looking at supporting the integration and the harmonious operation between these different entities? You see, first I'll just like to make a small correction. The imbalance man management services regulations are already out. This has been notified, so these are available. Okay. And that is what Mr. Akhil also pointed out that they have also 
started giving services under those regulations that is parking lending netting or trading now coming back to the original question with respect to what are the regulations which are there in store to take care of this entire system now look at when tso is operating what is our first expectation is that data should be available in a very transparent manner and some questions has been raised that whether cyber security will be an issue when the data is getting integrated for that purpose we are already developing a regulation under the access code only that is gas access bulletin board this gas access bulletin board will provide the data with respect to each and every pipeline which is being operated in this country what are the total capacity of that pipeline how much of that capacity has been booked and what is the available capacity when i am saying available capacity it means the common carrier as well as the other capacity out of the 75% talked about by mr ashu singhal which is available for booking so this capacity should be available along with the other parameters which are the technical parameters that at what pressure it can be injected and what pressure it can be taken out once these capacities are available now for any new user to book that capacity they need a simple system of booking so those simple system of booking will be provided we are in a digital world so everything should happen digitally that is the objective now we are trying to avoid the interface what we are saying is capacity is available any individual can go and book that capacity following the certain rules and regulation for that purpose we are coming out with a network code that that network code we are calling in our parlance as operating code this operating code will again define that if i have to book a capacity for a weekly basis or monthly basis or quarterly basis then what should be the timeline what should be the clearance time for these capacities and everything again i repeat has to happen in a manner when the response time can be reduced now we are thinking one step ahead also even after booking all the capacities some capacity is not used it should be again visible on the gabb and it can be booked on a shorter notice this is where we are looking for the timeline from the operators that how much minimum time they required to give the gas to a particular customer it means if i see the capacity on a gabb and i make my application for booking that capacity and how much time it will take what i mean time is after 3 hours can the gas flow be started in that pipeline provided i meet all the requirements so we are working on that process and as far as the gas transmission agreements are concerned the gta has concerned these are being standardized so that that same gta is applicable across all the shippers and transporters so one need not refer the gta again and again it will be part of the regulation i come back to the original thing which is being talked about many times the capacity trading now looking that capacity trading is going to take place in future pngrb in his gas exchange regulation while authorizing those regulations provide the scope of pipeline trading the pipeline capacity trading so we have a enabling provision there but for trading undertaking that trading you need the backup regulations also because today we are saying the capacity will be given at a fixed price so those kind of amendments once the market matures and at time the regulator or uh, pngrb is satisfied that the market is now mature and such products can be introduced in the market so those product accordingly those amendments will be made in the respective regulations even one step ahead also pngrb in its gas exchange regulation has come out with the concept of market coupling so whatever is spare capacity is available can it be coupled with the electricity market for that matter that both the market person can buy the capacity and side by side also take the sell the electricity and accordingly make a business model pngrb thought process is though we are a regulator we are also a facilitator for development of gas market in this country any new product which is in line with the regulation and if it's not in line with the regulation but it supports the development of gas economy in a very transparent free and fair manner such products certainly are welcome and any suggestions coming on that to pngrb will be a welcome suggestion and certainly we have a process of taking it forward uh, a public consultation process and others are there that will be followed great thank you thank you so much mr gupta and you know uh... Uh, like you said the suggestions are welcome uh, i can already see some suggestions you know in q and a already coming in 
so I think we've had an excellent panel discussion. Uh, and thank you so much to all the panelists for talking about, you know, the questions I had. We want to move to the next bit of this program where we take audience questions. So I've tried to incorporate some of the questions in my own questions already, but there are some other questions and comments that have come. So uh, th actually there are quite a few, so I don't think we'll be able to take all the questions, but I'll try to take a few of them. And the questions that are not answered, we'll request our panelists to maybe uh, give a response to these questions uh, and we will send them across uh, later. So Mr. Gupta, you know, just as you said, there is a suggestion here from a participant uh, and, that's, you know, and that's that the honorable board should also consider no requirement of signing of GTA between buyers and sellers. Uh, especially for the short term market, uh, because the same can be made part of the access code regulations. Payment could be routed through system operator. Once unified tariff is implemented, this could be done. That's a suggestion for you to consider. You know, uh, if there's a response, you can give that, or if, if it's not required, otherwise it's a suggestion. So I thought I should- No, give, I like to respond that. to that. One thing is we are making the GTI standardized and making it as a part of the regulation also. So once it is part of the regulation, the ultimate objective is this need not to be signed separately. It has to be signed only once if it is required for the purpose of taxation and other issues, right? Otherwise it need not to be signed again and again, only one part of the GTA that is capacity tranche. So that has to be every time booked and that also we are expecting should be done digitally. So person need not move, be moving with that particular submissions to a particular transporter or maybe shipper may be going place to places, it should happen automatically through the system. That is what is our ultimate objective. Right, so basically it's as good as not having a GTA because the document is standardized, the terms are standardized, and once you you know click, if effectively it's click and sign in, in that sense. Uh, but it will not be all the terms, there will be few conditions. Which sure. can still vary between a, a shipper to shipper. There, for sure. example, I can give you, there's a long-term uh, uh, arrangement is there with a particular shipper and they can have, uh, with a long-term arrangement, certain conditions. Like a shipper only wants the gas if it is fully available. Otherwise, they will not be able to operate their plant. So such kind of conditions, this will be very few and limited one. If right. it has to be signed between shipper and transporter, those can be incorporated, but otherwise it will be a standard deal. Sure. Thank you. There's one more comment which says we are looking forward to have less number of days, which is currently three days being utilized for booking of capacity. Uh, this will have a big impetus on the day ahead market. And I think we, we also talked about that. And I'm sure over a period of time, there will be contracts which are shorter duration to allow a day ahead and even intraday trading uh, of gas in the country. This provision is already there in our gas exchange regulation where we say that one can have the intraday as well as day ahead or time ahead kind of transaction. Now for doing intraday transaction, you need that capacity booking and delivery has to happen within that day. And this is where I talk about the response time. How much time right. an entity will take, that moment capacity is confirmed, the scheduling is done, how much time it will take to transfer the gas. So we are looking for shortening this time so that such products can be in the market and pipeline utilization can be increased. If the capacity is available for a particular day and if some particular shipper wants it for that day only, and even if he makes a request in the morning, then they should be able to access that capacity during the day. It may not happen at six o'clock, but it can start from 12 o'clock. So we are in discussion with the pipeline operators that what is their response time for giving the capacity during the day itself. So this three day is too long in today's parlance, it has to be reduced and it has to come to a very, very optimal level. Agreed. That Thank you, Mr. Gupta, for great points. And, you know, uh, I'm sure we have Ashuji and Akhil uh, listening and willing to sure, surely, you know, reduce that capacity time available to make the trading happen. Uh, I'll come to uh, maybe uh, Ashuji, you, there is a question from the audience, which I, I thought maybe I could direct to you. And that question is, how is the end consumer who is connected to multiple pipelines going to benefit from the TSO? See, it will have multiple advantages for the end customer in case the TSO is implemented because it's a progressive step for easing uh, for the interaction part of the customer with the transport, transporter and other operators. First that currently each customer has, if he has to travel the gas from a long distance, he has and multiple pipeline operators are there, then he has to go to each operator for booking the capacity. 
if tso is there there will be single point contact where each customer or supplier can book the capacity and that will be transferred to the operator for uh, booking the capacity or doing the necessary operation of uh, moving the gas into the system second is uh, increasing the reliability the deliverability as well as the interaction between different operators will be more harmonized and they can be handled in a better manner by a, by a uh, other than regulator also these things can be handled currently also it's not that the things are not happening it's happening currently also a customer is taking gas from uh, different operators and from different sources and it is moving on to the system but to increase more transparency more confidence in the customer it will be a, a right step in the right direction to see that more confidence is built and the perception also about various players that maybe some of the operators are not giving uh, the access transparently it will also be removed because besides regulator there will be a independent agency who is doesn't i mean other operators does not have a say in that operation of tso and like posoco posoco again has increased the confidence in the power market it is doing a better coordination between the exchange that role also can be played by tso therefore customer will have more flexibility in routing through exchange or directly booking the capacity then it will be a more transparent uniform and independent system which will be operating into the system compared to the current system where multiple operators have their different uh, uh, different mechanisms to book the capacity as well as standardizing the contracts will also be becoming easier so seeing and the gas bulletin board that role also will be played by tier so which again will be a good uh, enabler in uh, displaying what is the available capacity what pressures and all the relevant data which a customer needs to know as uh, mr gupta was rightly mentioning even within the day also if uh, if the system uh, response is adequate enough to handle such uh, request can be handled today also we don't uh, stop any customer if one day also in advance some of the customer do come we provide them the access because if the system response is adequate and the capacity is available we will not like it to go waste as well as we also give flexibility respect to within the day different type of flow rates are requested sometimes so all those requests even though they are not mandated by the regulator we keep on giving it because we want our pipelines to be used we want gas consumption to go up and we also see that the whole system is built in a more robust manner thank you thank you so much uh, ashu ji uh, for your response um, let me uh, you know uh, go now maybe to uh, one of our other panelists either jean marc or, or nicolas there is a question and i don't know if you know the answer but the question is how has the market share of ng changed over the period of time in the local market after the establishment of tso if you'd like to answer that live or if you could you know if not then maybe we could respond later no we, we can we can answer it as uh, it has decreased uh it has decreased uh, i think uh, i don't have a figure in mind but uh, ng has certainly less than 50% of the market today um and that was actually one of, also one of the purpose of this um, of this uh, market liberalization uh, ng at the beginning had to release capacities actually uh, on the grid Uh, over the long term, in order to allow uh, incumbents to to book those capacities and and have access to uh, to to supply routes, so yeah, NG share has been uh, has been decreasing over time. But okay, uh, that's also part of another st broader strategy uh, to di diversify its, ac its activities. So, uh, uh, but uh, it has decreased. So I don't know if Nicola has uh, has correct figures in mind, but uh, I can double check on the website if you. If you yeah, maybe just on a, on a. So the, the, the share of, uh, uh, according to the regulator, the, the share of uh, al alternative uh, suppliers is uh, close to 60% now uh, in France on the, on the end consumer market. But uh, it's one of the characteristics of Europe that we moved from countrywide um, uh, shippers, which were sort of local monopolies, to a trans-European uh, market, which means that shares which were lost in France by uh, the incumbent uh, were gained also to some part uh, in, in other countries. So there's a sort of uh, evening up. Uh, but I don't have the, the full full picture for, for NG. Uh, it's beyond the Chinese wall between us and the vertically integrated uh, 
company. Thank you, thank you, uh, John, Mark, and, and Nicolo for your for your response. Uh, we have, uh, you know, one question, Akhil, that maybe I can pose to you. Perfect. My apologies. Um, uh, Secretary Kapoor has arrived, and so we can take a break now and and uh, enjoy his keynote remarks. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. And I think, you know, we've had an excellent panel discussion. So let me thank the panelists for the time that they took to come and, you know, tell us about their experiences. Um, Nicholas, um, Jean-Marc, uh, Ashuji, uh, Mr. Gupta and Akhil, thank you so much for joining. And we have many uh, unanswered questions as well from the uh, audience. So we will, uh, you know, respond to those questions through email. So thank you and uh, welcome to the Sec Honorable Secretary and uh, Monali over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Gurpreet and uh, welcome uh, Secretary Karan Kupa, uh, Kapoor. Uh, thank you so much sir, for joining us today. I understand that you had a very busy schedule. So we are glad that you were able to make it. Uh, quickly to introduce you for the uh, you know, general audience, and I know you are pretty well known, but still, Sri Tarun Kapoor is the Secretary to the Government of India in the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. He's a senior member of the IAS services with over 33 years of experience at the state and national level. Before taking over as the Secretary of MOPNG, Sri Kapoor was posted as the Vice Chairman DDA. He has also held several positions in the government of Himachal Pradesh, looking at various portfolios, including power, environment, and forest, and has also worked as a joint secretary in the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, looking after national solar mission. We are really glad to have you uh, on board here, sir, and uh, we uh, welcome you to please deliver the keynote address. Over to you, Secretary Kapoor. Monali, I just wanted the Honorable Secretary also to know that today we have participants uh, from 38 countries uh, who are all very interested to know about this new development in India on the TSO. And they're all very look looking forward and very eager to hear your views on this, sir. Thanks for adding that, Gurpreet. Over to you, sir. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you for organizing this discussion. And thank you for inviting me to talk about uh, natural gas and role of the transmission system operator. So just to um, give an update, now in India, uh, we are largely dependent on coal being the biggest source for energy and uh, followed by oil and fast moving into uh, more and more uses, usage of natural gas. Uh, currently, if you look at the primary energy, then about 6.3% of the primary energy is from natural gas. And uh, uh, this is to increase to 15% by 2030, which is quite a major jump. And in order to uh, uh, ensure that this increase does take place and in order to ensure that the usage of natural gas goes up in the country, it is important that we put infrastructure in place, we get the correct regulations, we have the um, right policies and we also have uh, those requisite specialist organizations operating in the country. So on one side, we are working towards putting the trunk network in place. So already uh, we have the uh, trunk network partially uh, operational. So about 18,500 kilometers is already functional and we have to reach 34,000. With 34,000 kilometers, the trunk network would be complete and the entire country would be connected. And then we need the distribution network to come up fast. A lot of work is going on on building the distribution network. Uh, the uh, authorizations have been given by PNGRB, which is the regulator. And the companies who've got these authorizations are fast putting up the distribution network. Now this distribution network would involve laying off large uh, uh, kilometer length of the distribution lines and uh, connect every, uh, the idea is to uh, connect all the households, the industry, 
also feed uh, CNG, which means that the transport sector should also get served with the natural gas and uh, the commercial establishments. And therefore, the penetration of natural gas would go up tremendously in the country. Uh, currently, uh, uh, taking into account the taxation and other, uh, other related factors, natural gas is cheaper than uh, the uh, uh, petroleum or uh, oil-based uh, energy source that is petrol and diesel. And of course, it's easier to handle and clean up. Now, in order to uh, ensure that this network, once it's in place, is properly utilized and and uh, uh, we have uh, free trade in gas there are certain other things also which are required to be uh, put in place so transmission system operator is one of them so uh, this year in the budget also the finance minister has made this announcement that a independent transmission system operator would be set up there sometimes is a criticism that gale which is the owner of 70% of the trunk network and is also the largest trader in gas as a monopoly and may not allow smaller traders or smaller players in the sector to use the transmission network in a free and fair manner. So we have this proposal to set up a transmission system operator. The role of the transmission system operator would be that the uh, Pipelines would continue to belong to maybe government or private companies who have set up these pipelines, but the spare capacity would then get used by the uh, uh, by uh, any any anyone would be able to use that spare capacity, and it will be booked through the TSO. TSO would also keep account of the gas flow, would also keep account of the fund flow, and also ensure that this uh, uh, network is available without any uh, uh, anyone trying to monopolize or uh, not allowing free trade to happen. So we also have one gas exchange, which is fully functional now. And recently government has also allowed that the domestic gas can be sold freely through a bidding process. So, uh, and in, in any case, gas can be imported into the country. LNG can be imported into the country. So uh, with this, the effort is to open the market so that the buyers of gas are able to choose their supplier. They should be able to buy from uh, uh, any supplier who could be a trader. And the domestic producer of gas should also be able to sell gas freely in the market. And those who import gas should also have a available market and and then the market should should uh, determine the price so that's where we are moving towards and uh, uh, gale already has set up a good network control system where information about gas flow etc they have a control room here established in noida and uh, full information on gas flow in the various uh, pipe segments is available monitoring is possible. It's just that we have to give this job to an independent organization, uh, which will which will happen very soon. Uh, with this, we would want that more international players come into this sector to set up infrastructure. Uh, we would also want more international players to come into this sector to uh, trade in gas and uh, uh, to also get into city gas distribution. City gas distribution already is an open area and some uh, parts of the country are still to be authorized by PNGRB. They would come up with a tender shortly in which I think uh, uh, more companies would be able to participate and then become part of the city gas distribution system in the country. And uh, uh, we would also like uh, uh, international companies to come in to set up various other infrastructure is also planned to set up some storage and uh, we are also moving quite fast as far as LNG is concerned. Usage of LNG in transportation, usage of LNG 
for various other purposes including mining so there there should be a good scope to make investments in that sector also so uh, uh besides natural gas the uh, there are plans to also blend compressed biogas with natural gas so that the domestic producers of compressed biogas get a good outlet there is a plan to set up 5000 plants for uh, natural uh, for uh, compressed biogas and this gas would also flow into the network blended with the uh, natural gas there are also plans to uh, blend natural gas with hydrogen we have already done one experiment of hcng here in delhi and 50 buses are running and uh, some seven eight more pilots are planned and gradually we would we would uh, 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 see more uh, action as far as hydrogen usage in the country is concerned so this is some total of what we are planning and what uh, activities we expect in the coming future the uh, investment required runs into uh, several uh, uh, billion dollars some 60 billion dollar investment is required and a uh, huge huge uh, uh, growth expected in as far as natural gas in the country is concerned and uh, in any case india's energy needs are going to keep growing and then with that the demand for natural gas would grow but then we are talking of energy transition from uh say coal or even uh, some some uh, transition from diesel to natural gas and therefore uh, the required growth in natural gas would be much much more than the uh, growth in energy demand primary energy demand in the country so i invite uh, uh, the international companies to get into this sector and uh, we would be willing to provide any assistance if you require thank you thank you so much sir uh, for sharing what the government of india's plans are when the lots of participants have been are, are online to hear about that uh, with your permission sir if you give your permission we would like to take a photo of of all the panelists we wanted to do it earlier but uh, wanted to do with you in the picture so with your permission i'll just request everybody to please switch on the cameras and we'll just take 2 minutes uh, uh, mr gupta great and mr deer ipshita renial okay if i can ask uh, If you can, if you can give me a thumbs up once you're done, great. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for joining us, sir. Uh, really, uh, you know, we really appreciate your time, uh, despite your busy schedule joining us. And I'll just move now pass it on to Pramod to give the uh, closing remarks. So over to you, Pramod. Thank you, Manali. It has been a very engaging webinar, and I express uh, our gratitude to Shri Tarun Kapoor ji, Secretary of PNG. for sharing government's vision of making india a gas based economy he also invited global companies to make investments in the sector as there are opportunities galore in natural gas biogas and hydrogen so on behalf of the entire organizing team i am thankful to our participants for their time and involvement the recording will be made available to everyone we have also noted your questions and we will uh, email the responses i also extend our appreciation to usa for endorsing uh, this topic and guiding us in the preparation of this webinar thank you manali for setting the tone for today's webinar by sharing analogy with the indian power sector where grid operator has already helped uh, transform the sector i thank uh, sheila hollis for her remarks and sharing usa's work on emerging markets uh, globally and the kind of collaboration that uh, the asia gas partnership is forging uh, thank you ankit for uh, setting the context of today's webinar by explaining the different eso models uh, my sincere thanks to mr nicola for taking us through france journey in establishing a tso and the experience of grt gas as a tso you emphasized on the transparency of the activity of tso which is essential for building market confidence 
I'm also grateful to our esteemed panelists, Mr. Vimont, Mr. Gupta, Mr. Shingal, and Mr. Mehrotra for uh, sharing their perspectives for shaping up our TSO model for India. You covered a range of viewpoints and some of the things uh, I noted were related to uh, transparent uh, data disclosure, type of products and pricing, which are essential for a successful uh, TSO model. Thank you, Gurpreet, for the wonderful moderation and making sure that the audience benefited from the experience of the uh, panelists. My heartful thanks to USCA and the US Asia Gas Partnership for organizing this webinar. It will be uh, doing, uh, I'll be doing the uh, injustice if I don't, you know, congratulate uh, Sarah and Jake for working tire tirelessly and uh, coordinating uh, across multiple time zones to make this program help happen. Also selflessly selecting a time that suits majority, except uh, to both of you. I applaud my own SARE team for working behind the scenes to support this program. And ultimately, I can't thank enough the ICF team for their wholehearted support in organizing this webinar. Um, I put on record that it was a delight to work with Gurpreet, Ankit, and Inc. Uh, once again, and we truly look forward to this uh, collaboration in future as well. With these words, uh, we move to the end of uh, today's webinar. I hope everyone liked it and uh, thank you for uh, being here. Bye-bye and take care. Thank you, Pramod. All the best to everyone.